be good if I started the recording. <laughs> you just, it's hard to teach old dogs new tricks, you know it? Okay, um, so this is the standard uh, ASHRAE psych chart. <laughs> And so let's just jump to it. Down here on the bottom axis, we have dry bulb temperature. You know, so this one's going from zero degrees C. And if you guys that have had me, you know how I love these units. But anyway, I'm a, I'm a Fahrenheit guy, but anyway. I'm a, I, I, did, I did centigrade for you. <laughs> but anyway, uh, 50 is the highest. And so and these, you know, these are lines, I guess they're pretty much vertical. They may have a little bit of slant to them, but they're pretty much vertical lines. Over here on this axis is humidity ratio. And so this is the amount of moisture in a, that's kilogram of dry air. So when you do psych problems, every, all the flows, all the air flows are on the basis of dry air because the mass flow of dry air doesn't change through a device. But if you go across a cooling coil, you condense out moisture. And so that moisture falls out of there and you, know, you don't wanna change the flow rate. So we base all of that on um, the flow rate of dry air. Okay, here we go. Okay, so. The only dry air on this chart, completely dry, is this bottom axis down here. And as you go vertically, you're adding moisture. You go up, you add moisture. You go down, it's less moisture. Because that's what this axis is. It's uh, grams of moisture per kilogram of dry air, okay? Now, so that's the unit we really like to work with. But when they give you the weather forecast, what do they give you? They give you relative humidity. Relative humidity, frankly, is a pain in the rear as a unit. Because relative humidity is the amount of moisture in the air divided by the amount of moisture the air could hold. And so that's the percent. But as you change the temperature of air, hot air can hold a whole lot more moisture than cold air. So you could have air that's saturated at 100% relative humidity, and, and so 100% relative humidity is, is saturated. But if it's cold, it may not have much water in it. Whereas you could have air at, well, I wanna say at, at 45 degrees C, whatever temperature that is, hot, you know, at 20 or 30 percent relative humidity and it would have way more moisture and so you see that's why when we work problems we try to get out of these relative humidity units into a more absolute type measure such as humidity ratio okay so these sweeping lines are relative humidity so there's 10 percent 20 percent 30 percent 40 percent all the way up to 100 percent so this is saturation over here Okay, that's the saturation, 100% relative humidity, our saturation curve. That's where if you cram one more water molecule in the air, one is gonna fall out as liquid water on the ground. You can't get any more in there. Okay, so, you know, if you come over here and you take, let's say, what is this, zero, I don't know, there's 10. If you're 10 and saturated, you're over there, what is that, uh, I can't see, eight, about seven or so, someplace in the neighborhood of seven grams per kilogram. Well, what if I'm 40 and 30%, I'm up here at 14. So the relative humidity, it gives you an idea how close you are to saturation, but it doesn't tell you very well how, really how much moisture is in the air. Okay. Uh, other things we can look up, we have an enthalpy scale, and this is the enthalpy of the moisture in the air plus the dry air at whatever temperature and moisture level that you, um, you select. So if we were uh, 30 degrees and 30%, we would come here and then we would slide up to this scale and read it someplace around 50. And that's what kilojoules per kilogram. And so that's a quick way if you're working a problem on the FE exam and you need an enthalpy for moist air, 
Yeah, you can calculate it, but you got to look up several things. You just run to the site chart, find the point, run up and read it, you know, and it's not going to be perfect. But on the, on the FE, you don't have to be perfect. That's a multiple choice test. And so they'll give you four or five answers. One of them's right and the others are wrong. And so, you know, if you estimate those enthalpies, you know, within 10%, you're going to get close enough to select the right answer. And so you can move pretty quick through psych. That's why you want to spend some time uh, with this chart and maybe look in the thermo book. They work some simple. We're going to work with it a little bit. Uh, these are specific volume lines. This is, um, uh, let's see, that's 0 0.9, that's 0 0.92, and that's meters, uh, cubic meters per kilogram dry air. I have to read it because I, I don't usually, I use the US unit chart most of the time. So I'm not sure what the units are up here, <laughs> but it's all, it's all good. Okay, and the other line would be lines of wet bulb temperature, constant wet bulb. And so they're close uh, to the same slope as the enthalpy lines, but not quite. They're a little bit uh, steeper. So you can see the enthalpy lines, like here at 15, at saturation, the dry bulb and wet bulb are the same because we get a depression in wet bulb temperature by, evap by evaporation, but if you're saturated, you can't evaporate anything. And so the wet bulb and dry bulb are the same. So anyway, that's the basic uh, rundown on the site chart. We're gonna be bouncing back and forth to it here as we go through uh, this first solution. Okay, so this is gonna be the setup. Uh, and th there actually is a practical application for this as we get, and I'll talk more about that when we get in the problem. But it's basically a cooling coil, which you see here, and then it's followed by a heating coil. So we call this reheat in the business, where you cool something down. And the reason for cooling it down and heating it back up again is to, re to remove some moisture, to get some moisture out of it. And so you see in this first section, this would be the cooling coil, and this is just the condensate uh, drip pan. Um, you don't have, I emailed you the presentations. So I didn't print the presentation. So you're gonna to have to look at the screen, but you have that. Um, so, um, so this is the cooling section. Uh, water is gonna hit this thing and condense and fall down in the drain pan and run out of the control volume, okay? And so these are, they're assuming that the air here then is saturated. This fee is relative humidity. So they're saying this would be saturated. And you know we cooled it down, so T2 is less than T1. And the humidity ratio to two is less because we took water out of it. You know, the humidity ratio is gonna go down if you take uh, water out of it. And then we go through a heating section where we're gonna heat it uh, back up again. Could you pass those over? Oh, yeah. You have friends in high places, right? All right, sorry. Okay, and then on the side chart, it will look something like this. This is phi is a line of the, of the relative humidity at one at the dry bulb temperature. And then we were, we're gonna cool down to saturation. So we're gonna cool down until we hit the 100% relative humidity curve. And then we're gonna heat back. Now the problem that we're, that I actually have numbers for. We heat it all the way back to the same temperature. But, so this is a little bit of a generic diagram. Okay, we, we can jump back to that. So here's the problem we're gonna work on. So we've got airflow at 26 degrees C, relative humidity 80%, and AV. So what is AV? Well, you can tell that's a volume flow rate. So that's cross, A is cross-sectional area, and V is average velocity. Now we're gonna use V later for specific volume. I'm sorry, these letters get overworked. H's and V's and S's and whatever. But anyway, that's what that means. So you know, if you took meters squared times meters per second, 
you would get meters cubed per second. And in this case, that's our dry air flow rate, and that's 0.47 meters cubed per second. That's what's going through. Okay, when we get to location two, and we've got some water vapor falling out of the bottom of this, or not water vapor, liquid water. We condense vapor on the coil, it falls out the bottom. And then we have uh, the relative humidity is 100%, it's saturated. And then we're gonna heat it back up again to 26 degrees, but now it's 50% relative humidity because we dried it out. So this is one method of dehumidifying an airstream. The libraries and such have to control humidity or the old books will disintegrate and fall apart over time. Lots of places, operating rooms want a particular relative humidity. Semiconductor processors, when you're laying down semiconductors, you know, you gotta have the exact right relative humidity. So lots of particular places want humidity control. And this is one way that we can control the moisture because sometimes you have to make it so cold to get the moisture out. If you put it in the space, it's gonna be 52 degrees and everybody's gonna to freeze to death. So what do you do? You heat it back up again. Now you may not heat it all the way back to, to where you started, or you may heat it more. I mean, you know, this is just happened to be the problem that I found. Okay, so there any questions on, you know, what's going on in the device? Bring the air in, cool it down, hits a cooling coil, some of the water vapor condenses to liquid, falls down in the drain pan and exits at four. And we're gonna say that's condensate that exits at, uh, it's saturated at T2, which we don't know yet, we're gonna find T2. Uh, and then we heat it back up again to 26 and the relative humidity is now 50%. Okay, so uh, let's see, was there anything else I didn't read off? Well, we're gonna determine the, uh, the capacity of the cooling coil and the heating. So we'll see that. And so he, he lists a bunch of assumptions up there you can read. There is no work. That Q dot CV, there is heat transfer to the coil. What he means there, it doesn't, that's not very well stated. There's no stray heat transfer out of the ducts or anything. That's what that Q dot means. Because the first thing we do is calculate Q dot. And he says, well, there is no Q dot. Well, this is, that refers to stray heat transfer. And of course, we throw away kinetic potential energy. Uh, atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere. So that's standard atmospheric pressure. Um, and at T2 coming off the cooling coil where uh, relative humidity is 100%. We talked about the uh, condensate leaves at the saturation at T2 and moisture air is modeled as an ideal gas. In psychometrics, it's, we always assume ideal gas. We don't have enough temperature or pressure or anything to, to, to worry about the inaccuracy of the ideal gas law. So ideal gas assumptions are always made. Okay, one thing that's not on here, air is a binary, we consider air a binary mixture. It's dry air plus water vapor, okay? Dry air plus water vapor. So when you think about pressures, the total pressure, that one atmosphere, is made up of the partial pressure of the dry air plus the partial pressure of the water vapor, okay? And so you just have to keep that in mind, okay? Uh, so the first equation that we're gonna use is this one right here. And so this says that a humidity ratio omega, omega or W, whatever, is 0.622 times PV over P, the total pressure, minus PV, okay? So anytime you have moist air and you know, so this is the total pressure, so this for us is one atmosphere, okay? This is the partial pressure of the water vapor in of that air that's coming in at 80% relative humidity, okay? So we gotta know what that is, okay? So how can we figure out what PV is? Because we know the relative humidity is 80%. Well, we're gonna go to our steam tables. 
which we will also be reviewing in the Rankin cycle problem that we're going to do. So get out your behind your, I mean, the side chart had to be first, but the steam tables had to be second. I mean, this is like, these are the holy grails of engineering as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so let's see, what's our temperature is 26, 26 degrees C. So what's the saturation pressure for 26 degrees C? Can you find that? Lord, I hope so. Casey, I'm gonna pick on you. What, what's the number? It is 0 0.0336 bar. Bar, oh God, it's hard to say, isn't it, bar? Well, I do like bars. <laughs> That's not quite this kind. <laughs> okay, now, so if we were at 100% relative humidity, saturation, this would be the partial pressure. So when you are saturated, you just go to the steam tables at that temperature and that's your partial pressure of water vapor. You got that? But coming in this problem, are we saturated coming in? What are we? 80% relative humidity. So we have to modify this saturation pressure. What would be the easiest thing you could think of to do to modify this? Take 80% of it, and that's right. See, psychometrics is so easy. So to get this first state, we're gonna put in now, in terms of atmospheric pressure, we're gonna do that, we're doing this in terms of bars. So what's atmospheric pressure in bars? Well, you can look at the numbers up there, 1.03125. Mr. Dale, is that correct? Did I get that right? Dad gummit, I knew I wouldn't get it right. See, that's the, what is it? 01325. Now see, if this was US units, I'd get it right. 1.013, I hate this thing, 325. Whatever, that's atmospheric pressure, one atmosphere in bars. That's spankies plus a little bit of NETs, right? In, you know, so, so, so we can relate, right? Mr. Hogan, you, Mr. Hogan can relate, he's back there smiling. Okay, so this is gonna be 0.8 times, okay, I can't remember it. 0 0.03363. Okay, and this is the same thing. 0 0.8, 0 0.0363. Okay. Is, now, is there anything hard about that? That's pretty easy. Okay, and so you see the number, that comes out what, 0 0.017. And so what are the units on that? That's a humidity ratio. So what that says is, if I had a magic basket I get in that airstream, I got a magic basket and I swoop it through there, a container, and it grabs one kilogram of air. One kilogram of air. How much water vapor do, do I get with it? Oh, I get 0 0.017 grams. That's all that is. Okay. Now, um, okay, so at W3, whoops. Say we're going, we're going back to 26 degrees because that's what the problem says. I wouldn't have made it that way, but that's what the problem says, so that's the problem we're working. So we're going back to 26 degrees. So what's the saturation pressure at 26 degrees? Oh, well, I already looked that up. It's right here because this was 26 degrees. So now I can calculate the humidity ratio at the exit of this thing because it's 50% relative humidity. So I do the same calculation. I change the 0.8 to 0.5. Did 
because that's at the exit. Is everybody good? Okay. So when I do that, that's then the humidity ratio comes out 0 0.0105 grams per kilogram of <laughs> dry air. Ooh, a hard time saying that. Okay. So for every kilogram of dry air that goes through this thing, how much water do we take out? Well, you take 0 0.017 and subtract 0 0.0105 from it. That's how much it went down. That's what went down the drain per kilogram. And then, of course, we got a flow rate, so we got to take that flow rate into consideration. And I do that at the end of this. So, anyway. Okay. Now, the thing we don't know is we don't know the temperature at two, but we know it's saturated. Okay. So, what we can do is we can take this same equation. Let me clean it up a little bit. Okay, and so now what we're going to know is, let's see, we're going to know, yeah, we know the humidity ratio because the humidity ratio is the same at three and two. Well, we already know what it is, okay? So we know this, we know this, and so we can solve for the vapor pressure, and we know it's saturated, so we take that vapor pressure to the steam tables, and that tells us the temperature. Ha, oh, that's pretty sneaky. Okay, you see what, you see what? The only reason we can do this is because we know that W2 and W3 are the same. We already have W3, so we write this for W2, and this will put a two there, and a two there, and then we solve this for PV2. We go back to the steam tables. Okay, so let's go down and there it is. So it comes out, you can see he's done the algebra. Please don't make me do the algebra. You don't want to stay that long. I don't do algebra anymore. I'm too old to do algebra. So if, if I have to do algebra, I make a homework problem out of it and I make you do it, see? And then I, I get, if I get three of them, they're the same. Of course, if I, if I don't get three of them, they're the same, then I got a problem, right? <laughs> anyway, so doing that and plugging in, we get 0 0.0168 bar. So go back to your steam tables and confirm that that's about 15 degrees. So what is it? Point oh one six eight. Yeah, it looks like it's a little short actually. It's between 15, 14 and 15, but they didn't want to interpolate, so it's pretty close. So call it 15. Okay, questions there. We good? All right, let's move. All right, so now we're gonna do the control volume for the cooling coil. And this is also just slightly, whoops, I'm going the wrong direction, slightly misleading. Let's go back to here. So what, it, what he's doing in this first section is the air inside this dotted line is the control volume, just the air. Because this coil, if he was cutting across this coil, he'd have to have flow rates and conditions on the coil. But so he's making just the air inside this section is the control volume. Okay. He's playing it a little fast. Mark. So if we just do the energy balance, it's steady state, steady flow. So that's where the zero comes from. There is no work. You know, we don't have a stir or a paddle wheel or something, piston moving. So there's no work term. So the first law boils down to the heat transfer into the coil times uh, the mass flow times the enthalpy in minus the mass flow times the enthalpy out 
minus the mass flow times the enthalpy out because we got we got two we got what one any and two outies okay to put it in baby terms <laughs> i think that's funny but y'all know anyway i'm gonna make you pull up your shirts and and and, and see see what you see what you're carrying <laughs> anyway now what's interesting see this bracket term Casey, I'm going to pick on you again. What's that bracket term? Yeah, did, did you have HVAC last time? Who had HVAC with me last time? Nobody? Oh, what's that bracket term represent? That's the total enthalpy into the control volume. Well, it's got two terms. Well, we got a binary freaking mixture. One is dry air and the other is water vapor. So we got to have two terms to make up the enthalpy. Or you could just go read it off the site chart. All you got to do is take that inlet condition, read it off the site chart, and you're done. But this guy, of course, wants to punish you. So in this problem, it probably said, don't use the site chart. But on the FE exam, it doesn't say that. Okay. So HA1 is the enthalpy of dry air out of the dry air table. It's dry. There's no water vapor there. Okay? And the other term, W1, what's W1? What are, what are the units on W1? Omega. 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 That's what? Grams of water per kilogram of dry air. So see, that's the, the omega tells you how much water is in that airstream that comes in. And then you have to multiply it by whatever that is, H sub G. H sub G is, the G stands for saturation. That's a saturation gas enthalpy at one. In the, on these slides, G is saturated vapor. So that saturated vapor from the steam tables at temperature one, which is 26 degrees. Or you can just go look it up on the site chart. <laughs> okay. All right, and so, so the bracket terms are just the enthalpies, but it's a binary mixture. Okay, and then so minus M dot A. M dot A is the same. We got the same mass flow rate through this whole creature. You, you know, you could factor it out or whatever, those two terms. So that it's, that's just M dot delta H. But the, the H's are complex because we have two different components. So it's the same thing on the exit side, exit of, or it's the middle, it's the point that's saturated. So HA uh, two is the enthalpy of dry air at 15 degrees C. And we can go look that up in a table. In fact, we probably will in just a minute, okay? And W2 is the humidity ratio of two, and HG2 is the saturation enthalpy uh, of vapor at 15 degrees C, T2. M.4 is the amount of water vapor that's fallen out of the bottom, and HF4 is the enthalpy of the liquid water at four, and what are we told to assume? We assume, assume it's 15 degrees C. It's T, it says, assume it's T2. T2 we discovered was 15 degrees C. Oh, we're having fun now. Okay, so you do a mass balance on the water. And so we've got the amount of water that's coming in at M dot V, vape, it's vapor at one, vapor one, water, is equal to M dot vapor two plus M dot four. So the water that comes in, it either goes out or it falls down and goes out to drain. That's all we're saying. And so M dot V1 is M dot A times omega 1, or W, W omega, the humidity ratio. Because the humidity ratio, grams of water per kilogram of dry air, M dot is kilograms of dry air per second. You multiply it, you get what grams of grams of water per second that come in 
grams of water per second that leave and go out there. So it's just a water balance. So he's putting in those terms, M dot A. So the water that falls out the bottom is just the difference in the humidity ratio, we already talked about that, times the mass flow rate of dry air that's carrying it all through. Okay? So now he's just rearranging this, doing some algebra. So I guess he's bringing all this other stuff to the other side of the equation, factoring out M dot A and substituting in this mass. And so you wind up with this, and then you plug in. Okay, so uh, let's see. So if you go to the very, the very last two pages are the uh, ideal gas properties of air. And let's see, so we're 15 degrees C. What is it? You got now these are in Kelvin. You got to be careful. So Kelvin's two set what two seventy three? Is that right? Okay. So what two seventy three plus fifteen is two eighty eight. So the closest we can get is what two ninety. He's interpolated, but at two ninety you can look it up, and the enthalpy is two ninety point one six, and he's got two eighty eight point two. So he's interpolated that. So that's where that uh, 288.2 comes from. It's interpol. I'm not going to do the interpolation. Lord, I'm way too lazy for that. Um, and then the other was 26, right? So 26 plus 273 is 299. So that should be just a smidge less than the 300. And the 300 is 300.19. And he's got 299.2. So that's where that comes from, out of here. Okay. Uh, then we've got the humidity ratios. And then let's look up where let's look up these enthalpies. Let's see. So the 15 degrees C, we want the saturated vapor. So that's on the second page of this. Um, 15. 25.28.9, 25.28.9 right there, bigger than Dallas, okay? And the other was 26, and 26, the saturated vapor, 25.49, 25.49, there you go. And then the last one was water vapor at 15, uh, not water vapor, liquid water at 15, and that's, 62.99, there you go. So does anybody have any questions where any of those numbers come from? Woohoo, we rolling. Rolling, how am I doing? Oh, I'm, I'm good. Okay, so you turn the crank and you know, when you're just plugging the numbers in, you get what, 14.78 kilojoules per second. That's what that cooling coil is doing. And you see that last, I think that 0 0.41 term is that condensate falling out the bottom. And we often ignore the condensate. So if you're in a hurry on the FE exam and you got something like this, it's a cooling dehumidification, it's gonna be percent wise, what's that 0.14, what 10%, 5%, what is it, about three or four percent? It's not much. You could throw an extra three or four percent on for the condensate and be done with it. You know, it's not going to change the number very much. Okay, questions. All right. So now that's the harder part of them. So now we're back to just the heating section, and so all we've got is a coil. So again, in section two, the control volume is just the air inside that, not the coil itself, and so it's, that's pretty straightforward. Do, 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 do. Get back to the right page, there we go. Oh, oh, the other thing, I'm sorry, we gotta to convert to tons. Okay, so that 14.78 that kilojoules per second, a ton is a US unit. It goes back to the old days when the ice truck ran every 24 hours. And so your grandmother or your great grandmother, she had an ice box. You ever see an ice box? A real ice box? 
They got a compartment on top, compartment on the bottom, compartment on the bottom. You put a block of ice every day and it melts. And that's where your refrigeration comes from, the melting of the ice. So if you take one ton of ice, 2,000 pounds, the heat of fusion or melting of ice is 144 BTUs per pound. And you divide by 24 hours because that's every 24 hours the ice truck ran. And so if you, if you melted one ton of ice every 24 hours, the refrigeration effect is 12,000 BTUs an hour. And that is the definition of a ton. And this is just a conversion to metric. And it comes out to be one ton is 211 kilojoules per minute. So that's where he's converting to tons. So, you know, you, mul you multiply by one ton over 211 kilojoules per minute. And of course you got to put in 60 to make your time units cancel. And so you get 4.2 tons. It's negative because of the heat transfer sign. Sorry, I tried to jump over that. Okay, so on to uh, energy rate balance for control volume two. Well, this is Q dot is M dot delta H. It's the same thing. He's already done the algebra because he ain't going to the psych chart. You can, you can do this far quicker. You just go pull those enthalpies off the psych chart. Well, let's do that. Let's do that. Okay, so let's see. Whew, well, I'm gonna do it on this one. Okay, so what where we come off of that coil, we're what? We're hundred percent saturated at fifteen degrees C, right? We come off the cooling coil. Okay, so look on your side chart. And let's see, so there's 10, there's 15. Oh man, that's perfect. Forty. That's 42, the enthalpy. Everybody agree? Man, that's right on 42. Look on your side chart. Saturation curve at, Got start it start down on the bottom at 15, or you can look either there's a 15 on the saturation line, which is fine, and then just read up to the enthalpy scale, and that puppy's dead on 42. That's a good number. Everybody good? Okay. Now we're going to go over. We're going to go straight across because because at that point there's no moisture addition. We can't go up, that would be moisture addition on the side chart. We can't go down, that would be moisture removal. We're going straight over to 26, and then we're going to read another enthalpy. So, uh, 20. Okay. This one's a little harder. I don't know, what do you think? 53? What do you think? What do you got, Luke? 53? Are you with me? Okay, 53. Okay, so now. Where am I? I'm lost in, lost in space. There we go. Okay. So just subtract those two. So we've got 53 minus 42 equals this times 0.54. So that's 5.94. Yeah, so I got, I got 5.94 and he got 6.05. Ain't bad, good enough for government work, right? Heck yeah, send him a bill. Send them an answer, send them the bill. Okay, so anyway, or you can dig out, yeah. Mm -hmm. on the, on the chart, how yeah, you okay, here, let, let me do it up here on the, that's good, no, I asked, didn't I? Whoops. Okay, so the first one, here's 15, right? 
So there's 15, and maybe it's right on that line. And that's 40, 42, 44, 46, 48, 50. You got it? Reading the enthalpy scale right here. You got that? Okay, now I'm gonna come across to 26. Uh, there's 25, 26. It's about here, maybe a little bit down. And then you gotta read that back out on the enthalpy scale. So I read it at 53. I lost my, my daily. Okay, and you're reading up here on this scale. So it's someplace in there. If you got a straight edge, you can do better. Okay. Okay, or if you want, I mean, you got all those numbers. I mean, you just 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 plug them in, you know, and that that gives you your answer. And then the last, whoops, there, there it is. That's plugging those in. And then here, I type this up. I, that's not bad. Looks better than that that other scrawling, doesn't it? Problem is, you know, it takes a while. You know, I thought about typing the whole thing, but good lord, I mean. I didn't do this until Sunday, and uh, I, I wouldn't have got any sleep at all. So that just shows that's the uh, that's just the difference in humidity ratios times the mass flow rate. So it comes out 0 0.00351 uh, kilograms of water per second, and then 3,600 seconds per hour. So that's about 12.6 kilograms uh, per hour. I mean, that's a fair amount of water. You know, you do it over a day or something, that's a, you know, you gotta make sure that, gotta make sure that condensate drain don't stop up or it's gonna overflow. You know, we got any brown ceiling tiles in here? Nah, that looks pretty good. You know, you go in the, you go in most buildings, been there a while, you look at the ceiling tiles, they got little brown spots on them. That's where the condensate, either the pipes of, the cold pipes have dripped condensate or these condensate drain tanks, the drain got stopped up and overflowed and went out on the ceiling tile and they didn't replace it anyway. Okay. All right. Ta -ta -ta. Take a deep breath. <gasps> Steam. Woo. Let's go. How we do? Oh man, this is good. We're going to get through maybe. Okay. Well, you remember the PVT surface, the three dimensional diagram. So, you know, we do a TV, a PV, and a TS, and a PT, and all that stuff. So, those three are just different, looking at this from different two-dimensional views. So, you know, the PT, if you look at it over here, you get this one. And you get the PV if you look at it from this direction. And notice that saturation dome, when you look at this, really lies back in there. And so you see how that, that's that saturation dome, you're just looking at the edge of it, you're looking at that edge right there, how that thing lies back in there. But when you look at it this way, you really can't tell, you know, that's just a 2D view. So anyway, but I implore you to review your diagrams because you got all these different diagrams and you need to know how to function with each one because those rascally rabbits that make that test up they may test you on a PV diagram over here and a TS diagram over here and a PT diagram over here. So, you know, and it's all pretty much the same stuff. You just got to get in your mind, you know, got to get your mind right. Okay, so my favorite is the TS diagram. So I put it first. Because, you know, now we don't have a surface for it, but it looks pretty much like the others. So, you know, what have you got? You got your saturated liquid line, goes up to your critical point, and you got your saturated vapor line that comes down here. And if you make this stuff cold enough, then it becomes uh, solid, solid vapor or vapor, and you can sublimate. If you come across down here, you go directly from a solid to a vapor. That's called sublimation. But you probably, those problems are not all that common. So I wouldn't think you'd have to worry about a sublimation problem, but I mean, it follows the same rules. Okay, you need to know, like on a TS diagram, how to draw an isobar. An isobar is a line of constant pressure. So we're showing, you know, 
all these different lines. So they come down, this is superheat over here, superheat. This is just fluid above the critical point. This is compressed or subcooled water. And then this is the solid vapor down here. But so you come down. At, so if you, if you come down at constant pressure, you lower the temperature, you come down to here, and then you start condensing, right? And you go all the way across the dome until you get condensed. And then these things all kind of trail off together. Uh, they just get real close together. So this, the guy I stole this from didn't, didn't draw but one of them, but they all follow that same path down through there, okay? So make sure you know how to draw an isobar on a TS diagram. Okay. Uh, a T temperature specific volume diagram. Well, dad gum, that looks pretty similar. You know, the, you the dome, the dome is the dome. It may be squished a little bit one way or the other, but it has the same meaning. Saturated liquid on this side, compressed or subcooled liquid over here, critical point. On the other side of the critical point, saturated vapor, superheat vapor, and here, this is a, an isobar, looks very similar as the TS diagram. So that's really what you need to know. You just need to know how to draw these isobars on these two and have, you know, just generally understand what it's referring to. And here is the PV diagram. So on this one, you get the isotherm and see this one comes down, compressed liquid over here, then saturation across from saturated liquid to saturated vapor, and then superheated comes down this way. So, you know, it's easy. I mean, well, when I teach thermal, I have to constantly be careful because I'll screw them up. I'll screw them up every time. So you just got to be careful. Have your thinking cap on. And then this is the PT. So this is looking at the side of the dome. And so, say, here is melting from solid to liquid, and here's vaporization from liquid. And see that thing, when it gets to that point, it's coming at you across the dome because you're looking at the side of the dome. So it's coming out of the plane at you, and then it continues into the uh, superheat region. So anyway. Okay. All right, so this is the first uh, problem. Now, the answer is up there, but so this is water. You got the steam tables. So if I give you water at five bar and 151.9, tell me what it is. Well, I should have I covered it up on one made you look and then but you would have had it in front of you anyway well so what are you going to do you you take the round number the five bar and you go to the pressure table which is the second one the first one's always temperature the second one's pressure uh where is that uh pressure it's on 725 you go down and find seven no five i'm sorry and you look over to the next column and get the saturation temperature and go, oh my gosh, it's 151.9. So I'm saturated. Am I saturated liquid or saturated vapor or what do you think? I don't have enough information because when you're, when you're saturated, Temperature and pressure are not two independent properties. You gotta have two independent properties to fix a state. So by telling you saturation at five bar, I told you 151.9. You just had to look up and see what the number was. That's only one piece of information. You gotta have some other piece of information to figure out whether you're saturated liquid, got some quality in between. Quality is the percent that's vapor, 100% quality is saturated vapor. 0% quality is saturated liquid. They might give you that definition. What's the quality of a superheated vapor? 
Is it one? Huh? 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 Sort of my brain trust over here. Brain trust? Mr. Casey, come on, let me pick on you. Do you remember that? What was the question? <laughs> Luke, would you would you wake him up from time to time? Thank you. Uh, superheated vapor. What's the quality of superheated vapor? Undefined. It's only defined inside or on the dome. And they might ask you that. If I, I mean, I, I'm, if I was making up questions, I want to make up a trick question, I would. I'd put zero, one, all of the above, undefined. And undefined is the right answer. It's undefined because it's only, it only has meaning between saturated liquid and saturated vapor. Okay, anyway. All right, so five bar 200. Well, see, this is where you got to be able to draw all these isobars and isotherms and all of that stuff. So, you know, so he's only, he's only putting these two on here. He's not putting a TS because this is chapter three stuff and you don't get the entropy until chapter six. So he didn't do any TSs on this. But it's probably easier for me on this one. But so this is a TV diagram. You draw a line like here. You say, that's my isobar. That's five bar. You go check the temperature and you put it down here because you just looked it up. It's 151.9 and you're at a higher temperature. What do you get to a higher temperature? you've got to go out into superheat land. So you've got to be superheated vapor. Or you can think about this one. You can draw, this is pressure, draw it all the way across. Draw your uh, isotherm at 151.9 and then say, well, this is 200, so it has to be outside of that. So to get outside of that, I have to go out into superheat land. So whichever diagram you like, you know, I mean, I think everybody has their kind of favorite that they kind of, they're kind of their go-to diagram and this kind of stuff. But anyway. Uh, okay, here's one. 25 bar and 200. Well, okay. So what's the saturation pressure at 200 C? 200 C. Oops. 200 C, have I got it? 15.54, right? Okay, so that's what he did. So um, he draws an isotherm. He checks the saturation pressure for that temperature. It's 15.54, and then he draws another line across, because this is a PV diagram, and wherever this 25 bar pressure line crosses this isotherm is the state. And so that's subcooled or compressed liquid. Okay. Or you can do it over here. You can draw, you can put your, you know, this is temperature. So you just draw a line for 200, draw the uh, isobar that corresponds to that and look up what it is at 1554 and you're above it this 25, so you draw another isobar, and wherever it crosses 200 is your state, and again, your compressed liquid subcooled. Okay? Uh, let's see. D, where, uh, let's see, we're 160 and uh, 4.8 bar. Okay, so at 160, again, I would look up that. Uh, Saturation pressure, 6.178. So you draw the isotherm, draw that pressure across there that corresponds with it, and then draw your pressure and see where it crosses. Crosses in superheat land, superheated vapor. Okay, and this last one, it's the same thing. It's just lower temperature, so. I'm getting tired of these. I bet you are too. All right, let's go. Okay, so this is quality calculation. And so that's showing it for saturated 
uh, vapor and saturated liquid in a container. So that V would be the overall specific volume for that container. So what you do is, and the V can be what? It can be enthalpy, it could be H's, that's fine. It could be S's, it could be entropy. It's the same equation, you just change out the letter. It could be internal energy, be any of those things. Okay, so this was the slide I found, so we got V's. So, and I mean, you can do it this way, but this is the way we usually, so to calculate the specific volume in the, or to calculate the quality, what the way this problem is usually given, we know the total mass and we know the total volume so we can calculate the V and we use this to calculate the X. But if you know the X, then you can calculate the overall, to, you know, whatever you happen to know. But this is the what, the specific volume of saturated liquid, F is for fluid, this is the X. So if it's all liquid, that's zero. If it's all vapor, that's one. And this is the specific volume of the saturated uh, vapor. And then that's the liquid again. And so that's the uh, calculation. Okay. All right, so isentropic uh, efficiency, we're gonna get into that on the steam turbine. An isentropic efficiency is a second law efficiency, okay? For a tur it's the comparison of an ideal component to a real component. And so turbine produces work, so a real component is gonna produce less work than an ideal component. So it's the, in this case, it's the actual divided by the ideal, okay? And so you see, um, just in terms of the enthalpies, it's the same inlet enthalpy minus the exit enthalpy for the actual divided by the inlet enthalpy minus the exit enthalpy for the isentropic. Okay, for a pump, a pump is a work consuming device. So a real pump is gonna require more work input than uh, an isentropic. So it's switched, it's the isentropic on the top and the actual on the bottom to make sure that the number is less than one because it's uh, an efficiency. Okay, uh, for in the, in the Rankine cycle, this is for an incompressible fluid. Uh, the, the, in, and this is isentropic. So this is, this is constant entropy, but that work is the integral of VDP and so if you assume the specific volume is constant, then you get V times DP integrated between two points. And so it's just, you know, P2 minus P1 or P4 minus P3, whatever subscript, yeah. What's that? that, that, that that's for a pump. We're, oh yeah, P is pressure, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's the, uh, that work is the integral of V DP usually has a minus sign out front, but whatever. Okay, all right. So, so here is our first problem. And this is, you know, just kind of a medium size uh, Rankine cycle problem. So it's regenerative, which means it has one, at least one feed water heater, which is right here. We got a boiler, we've got uh, two turbine sections. We've got an extraction coming out. And then we have the second turbine section, condenser, pump, feed water heater, condensate is pushed uh, out of the feed water heater through a trap back to the condenser. And this is what we're gonna work on, okay? So the TS diagram, that's why the diagram we usually use on these. So this is coming out of the boiler. This is my superheated steam um, at, uh, it's 100 bar and 480 degrees C, which is 10 megapascals. And um, this is our extraction pressure, seven bar. So we're gonna expand uh, partially or through the first turbine section uh, down to uh, seven bar from 100. 
and then we're going to extract a certain amount of steam. And that steam goes over here to seven because it's going into the feed water heater where it's condensing. And this is a line of constant enthalpy where it's being trapped back into the condenser flow. Uh, the rest of the steam continues on through the section, second turbine section from two to three, and then it enters the condenser. This is where the, uh, the, uh, the extraction condensate is coming back in. All this goes back together, goes through the pump, gets pumped through the feed water heater and goes back to the steam generator. And so that's the TS diagram. And now this first problem is ideal, which means that the isentropic efficiency of the turbine and pump are 100%. Then I've got a variation on this where we put uh, isentropic efficiencies on those. But let's work this one first. Okay. Um, let's see. The first, uh, the first state is just a lookup. That's just superheated steam. That's a lookup. The uh, second state is right here. And so this is working in the two phase region. So this is using this equation for with the entropy. Okay. And so what you do is you come down here at points at seven bar, you go into the uh, steam tables at seven bar, and you look up the entropy of saturated liquid, which is 1.9922, and that becomes the number right here on the entropy scale, 1.9922. This one over here is the, for the saturated vapor, that's uh, 6.708, okay, 6.708. And see, 6.708 is greater than 6.52, and so that tells us I have to be inside the dome, okay? So this is that equation, all it's done been rearranged to solve for X2, the quality, and so if you plug those numbers in, you plug in um, S2 is the same as S1. You plug in for the fluid, the 1.99, and the other, the 6.708, and you should calculate this quality right here. So you're, you're almost all vapor, but you're a little bit liquid, okay? And then you have to use that same quality to calculate the enthalpy so then you come back to this same equation and you put in the enthalpy of the liquid and the enthalpy of the saturated vapor and the enthalpy of the liquid and the quality and then you calculate that enthalpy. So there's a, they don't show all of the steps, but that's where that enthalpy comes from, from that quality being inside the dome. Okay? Then... Uh, state three, go back to the diagram. So basically we do the same thing, but we do it at a lower pressure. So it's 0.06 bar. And so that's, the, that's in the pressure table, that's the second entry. So there, the, in, the entropy of saturated liquid is 0.521, and the saturated vapor is 8.3304. So we take those back and we use this same equation. And because this is isentropic, this entropy doesn't change. It's a straight drop because it's an ideal turbine. It doesn't, we don't generate any entropy across the turbine. Okay. So we use this same uh, starting entropy. We use this same equation, but we write it around state three. And so when we do the arithmetic, we get a quality at three of 0.7692, which says we're about 77% vapor, or we've got a whole lot more liquid at this lower pressure. And that's kind of what the diagram shows, okay? So, not too bad. 
uh, and then on to four, we got to keep referring. So four then is saturated liquid at 0.06. So that enthalpy is uh, 151.53, just out of the table at 0.06 bar. Uh, let's see. Oh, and, and of course up here at three, we then had to take this quality and calculate that enthalpy using this expression with enthalpies here, here, and here instead of specific volumes. So it's the same equation. You just use it for enthalpy. Okay, so that's uh, this one and this one. Okay, so this is um, this incompressible. So this is across the pump. Okay, so this is from four to five across the pump. And so we assume water is incompressible. So we use this that the work across the pump is the specific volume times the pressure change. That's the work that goes into the fluid. So if we take the incoming enthalpy, add the work to it, we get the exit enthalpy. So that's the trick here. So we take this enthalpy at four, we calculate the pump work in, in, in the same units and we add it on to four and that gives us the enthalpy at five. That's why when I, when I teach the power plants class, I call this the pump trick. So and they say it's approximate, it's a little bit of an approximation. So that's the enthalpy at four and that's the specific volume at floor and that's the pressure difference. So this is the, the uh, energy increase across the pump and this is what came in so what goes out has to be what came in plus what was added. And of course, you gotta be a little careful on units to get the units to work out right. So I'll let you study the units up on this, but be careful on units. But so this uh, VDP term term turns out to be 10.06. So that gets added onto the enthalpy at four, which is 151.53. And so the enthalpy of five is the sum of those 161.59, okay? Uh, let's see, and then at uh, six, at state six, this is, we're at pressure, but we're coming out of the feed water heater. We're just told to assume that the temperature is the saturation temperature at seven bar. So you gotta, so at seven bar, uh, I've got that right here. Uh, that's 165. If you, when you, you just look it up in the in the table, so that's 165 C, and uh, that enthalpy. Well, let me see. That is liquid. So that enthalpy is 697.22. 697.22. He's making the same assumption for seven. And now let me show you another little trick. Um, this trap, this is just a throttling type device down here at the bottom. If you ignore kinetic potential energy, which we're doing, the enthalpy in is the enthalpy out on a throttling process, okay? So the enthalpy at seven is the enthalpy at eight. Okay, so we've got that. There we go. So we got the enthalpy. So the whole trick on these things is getting your enthalpies calculated. So I, you can't stress too much being able to operate in the steam tables correctly. Okay, so now we're just plugging and chugging uh, the steam generator and we're not given a mass flow rate. So all we can do is the enthalpy difference so it's like kilojoules per kilogram of flow, which makes it, you know, I guess a little bit easier. So the, the heat transfer per unit mass is just H1 minus H6. That's the enthalpy leaving the boiler minus the enthalpy coming in. So you see the subtraction, uh, we get 2624 kilojoules per kilogram. Um, and then let's say, okay, so, uh, oh yeah. Uh, so we have this extraction. So we have to calculate 
when you look at these numbers, this one indicates this is all of the steam out of the boiler. The Y represents the fraction of the steam that is pulled out of the turbine at this point too. So, you know, you can make up a number, could be 10%, could be 20%, could be 30%. But that is, that's what the fraction of, the, of this uh, main steam flow out of the boiler that's pulled out. So the rest of it, if this was 20%, this would be 80% goes on through the turbine. Okay, and then, so that 80% goes into the condenser, that 20% goes down to the feed water heater, condenses, passes through the trap back in here. So 80% and 20% is 100%. So we have the full flow together, exiting the condenser that goes through the pump, through the heat exchanger, back into the boiler. Okay, so we, we have to, so what you do is you do a heat balance on the feed water heater. If you have two, you go to the high pressure heater. You do the highest pressure heater first. So we're just showing one. So we just do a, a you know, summation of enthalpy, mass times enthalpy in is equal to summation of mass times enthalpy out. It's pretty simple. So that's what we're doing here. So if you look at it, let's go back. So what we've got, this is H2 times Y. That's the way we write that. So that, let's say if that's 20%, it's point, it would be 0.2 times H2. But of course, we just write Y because we're gonna solve for Y. So then this, and that's coming in. So this is coming in. So this is one because the whole flow is back together again times H5. So those two add together and they have to equal, this is the whole flow over here. So one times H6 plus y times h7 and that's the balance so so th this is coming in this is coming in this is coming out this is coming out and so that's what we've done here if you multiply across you see we've got y times h2 minus h7 and it's equal to h6 minus h5 just solve for y so in this problem it's 26.95 percent of that steam gets ex extracted in that feed water heater. Okay, now we're gonna do the turbine. And so again, we have the full flow through the first turbine section. So that work per unit mass is gonna be just what? H1 minus H2. For the second section, it's gonna be one minus Y times H2 minus H3. Once you get the hang of it, it's pretty simple. So that's what we have here. Plugging in the numbers. You know, now we know what Y is because we saw for it up here. So the total turbine work is 1129.7 kilojoules per kilogram. And then for the pump, it's just H5 minus H4. So subtract those and we already calculated that. That's the 10.06 kilojoules per kilogram. So that's really the bulk of it. Now we can do the network per cycle. It's what the turbine produces minus what the pump requires. So the one 1129.7 minus 10.06, uh, what is that? Uh, 11, 11, 19.6, whatever. And then the efficiency is this network divided by the boiler heat input. So that's what the 2624 goes in the boiler. That comes out to 42.7% uh, cycle efficiency. And for the condenser, we just do another heat balance. <clears throat> We've got energy in. So this would be uh, H3 times one minus Y in. This would be uh, H8 times Y in. And this is, has, has to equal Q out plus H4 times one, because that's a, the entire flow out. So that's the heat balance on the condenser. So this is it. And so plug in the numbers. And so we're rejecting 1504.1. Uh, so this, 
plus the net work should equal the boiler heat input. Does net work equals net heat? I'm sorry, or the, I'm sorry, the boiler heat input minus this should equal this. Because remember for a cycle, net work is equal to net heat, okay? Now, the only other thing I've got to show you is it gets a little more complicated when you put an isentropic efficiency. You have to recalculate some of those states. So what, we've, what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, the pump and the turbine have isentropic efficiencies of 0.8. Okay, so that changes the diagram a little bit. Um, instead of coming straight down, this, this, because this turbine is generating some entropy, this dash line comes over here at an increased entropy. And then, so you have to figure out this point. And then, again, the isentropic would come straight down from there, but the real one has more entropy generation. So say you have to evaluate this point and then you have to reevaluate the entropy at that point, bring it straight down and then evaluate the actual point over here at three. Just compare and contrast that to this one, which just comes straight down all the way. So that's the complication that's added with the isentropic efficiencies. Okay. Um, so here's how you do it. The first state did not change. So this is the definition of the isentropic uh, turbine efficiency. It's H1 minus H2 actual minus H1 minus H2 isentropic. Well, we know the H2 uh, isentropic from the previous problem. We found it uh, a few minutes ago. So, and we know this is 0.8, right? So we simply use this equation. The only thing we don't know is H2. So then we solve this equation for H2. Here, we plug the numbers in, and now H2, instead of being 2684.8, is 2812.1. Uh, so it's a different enthalpy, okay? And then state three, uh, we have to do the same thing, but we have to determine this entropy right here before we can do the uh, second portion of the turbine. So you have to go back into the tables and interpolate. And that's what he's doing here. Uh, so he's saying um, S2, see S2 actually increased to 6.81 from 6.5282, okay? So then this is the starting entropy for the second turbine. Uh, and again, it's, uh, the turbine efficiency is 0.8, so we have to go back and determine this um, isentropic state right here. So, we know this entropy, it comes straight down. So we know this point and we know this point. And so we're back to calculating the quality and the quality then gives us the enthalpy, the isentropic enthalpy. And then we use the uh, isentropic turbine efficiency equation to give us the final enthalpy. So, you know, you, I just don't have time to go through all of those numbers, but you need to look through this if you, if you work through it a little bit. It's not, it's just a number of steps. Once you go through a couple of them, it's really not so complicated. But then you also have to do the pump. So this pump used to come straight up. Now it bends over because there's an increase in entropy. And so we have to use that isentropic uh, efficiency of the pump, which is similar, but now the uh, isentropic state is on top and the actual state is on the bottom because the actual pump requires more work than the isentropic pump. 
And so we knew the isentropic enthalpy before 161.59, and we know it's 80% on the efficiency. So we plug in, and this gives us, we can solve for H5, and it's 164.11. The other states remain the same. And so we're simply plugging in to, this is the boiler, H1 minus H6, it didn't change. Uh, the extraction steam changed because some of these enthalpies changed. So that's the, the heat balance on the feed water heater. So it comes out 25.21% this time. Um, so that changes the enthalpies change and the, the extraction percent change. So that changes the turbine work a little bit. Uh, 935.98 is the turbine work. Or was it before? It was um, turbine work before was 1129. So it's down 150 or roughly something like that. Okay. So the pump work goes up. It was 10, 10.0 something before. Now it's 12.58. So the network is down to 923.4. Same boiler heat input. So our cycle efficiency is now 35%. So it's down. And then the condenser uh, has to reje is rejecting 1700 before the condenser was rejecting 1504. So the condenser rejection increases. Okay, questions? Sorry, I kind of, I guess, well, did I run long? Not too bad, maybe a little long. You know. So on the, the mass fraction, you said that the mass balance on the feed water heater? Yep. The extraction fraction, right? Yeah. Yeah, to solve for that Y. Yeah. You just do summation of mass times enthalpy in is equal to summation of mass times enthalpy out. And the mass drops out. Yeah, it'll just because it's yeah, because um you have the same amount of mass coming in here as you're going out. Yeah, you, you're, you're writing all of that in terms of this mass flow right here. Everything is written in terms of that. Okay. The mass flow rate out of the boiler. So. And your Y gives you that fraction. That's right. Because, because this steam, the, 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 growth, the total amount of this steam, if you knew what this was, it's, it's you know, like 25% of this. So, but you don't know this, so you just, you, you can write that letter, you can write M.1 on all those terms, but every term will have an M.1 in it, and so they all cancel out. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Even these terms will have M.1 in with the Y. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. yeah. everything is times M.1. Okay, guys, thanks for your kind attention. I don't know. Uh, the 13th. Oh, 13th. Yeah, I think it's a week from Thursday.